Non-sapient alien creatures. Varen. Varen are omnivores with a preference for living prey. Originally native to the Krogan home world of Tuchanka, they are, like most life from Tuchanka, savage, clannish, and consummate survivors. They are pack hunters when vulnerable prey is readily available and become scavengers when outnumbered or outclassed. Their supreme adaptability, vicious demeanor, and rapid breeding cycle have made them ubiquitous and dangerous pests on many worlds. Virtually everywhere the Krogan have been, Varan infestations have followed, wreaking havoc with the native ecology. The Krogan have had a love-hate relationship with Varan for millennia, alternately fighting them for territory and embracing them as treasured companions. To this day, Krogan raise them as beasts of war, one of the common subgenus of Varan has metallic silver scales, leading to the rather unusual nickname, fish dogs. So were we fighting the fish dogs when we were fighting them on uh, Pharos there? Or? Hmm. Although that means the Krogan were on Pharos before the humans were. I wonder what that means about the Prothean ruins. Maybe they scavenged a bunch of stuff from the ruins and then they left. And that's why we can't really find anything there. Hmm. I guess we'll never know. Let's keep going. Uh, Human and Systems Alliance. We did that one. Military Doctrine. Excuse me. Jesus. The Alliance military is of great concern to the galaxy. At first contact with the Turians, they were completely inexperienced. Turian disdain changed to respect after the relief of Shang-Chi, where the humans surprised them with novel technologies and tactics. The human devotion to understanding and adapting to modern space warfare stunned the staid council races. For hundreds of years, they had lived behind secure walls of long-proven technologies and tactics. The council regards the Alliance as a sleeping giant. Less than 3% of humans volunteer to serve in their military, a lower proportion than any other species. But we're still pretty damn powerful. While competent, Alliance soldiers are neither as professional as the Turians, nor as skilled as the Asari. Their strengths lie in fire support, flexibility, and speed to make up for lack of numbers with sophisticated technical support, such as VIs, drones, artillery, and electronic warfare, and an emphasis on mobility and individual initiative. Their doctrine is not based on absorbing and dishing out heavy shocks like the Turians and Krogan. Rather, they bypass enemy strong points and launch deep into their rear support, cutting supply lines and destroying headquarters and support units, leaving enemies to wither on the vine, as the military term goes. On defense, the human military is a rapid reaction force that lives by Sun Tzu's maxim. He who tries to defend everything, defends nothing. Garrisons are intended for scouting rather than combat, avoiding engagement to observe and report on invaders using drones. The token garrisons of human colonies make it easy for alien powers to secure them, for which the Alliance media criticizes the military, and so does Shepard. <laughs> Frankly. However, the powerful fleet stationed at Phase Gate nexuses, such as Arcturus, are just a few hours or days from any colony within their sphere of responsibility. In the event of an attack, they respond with overwhelming force. And that's what happened at Shang-Chi. We responded with overwhelming force from Arcturus, and then the Turians got their asses kicked off our planet. <laughs> but, um, by the way, Sun Tzu's The Art of War is a very good book if you ever want to read it. Um, what was I going to say here? Something about... Yeah, this whole sleeping giant thing. We have a lot of military power, but only 3% of, humans, of the human species volunteers to serve in the military. And according to what I understand about this series, there is no draft, because there isn't really any war that would require a draft anymore. And it would be kind of hard to have a draft anyway, because they've got colonies everywhere and stuff. So, basically, if we ever got into a fight with another race for some reason and we decided to have a draft or you know we had the whole nationalism yeah earth is powerful movement akin to what happened uh in world war ii after pearl harbor we would probably destroy the other uh, military force in spite of the fact that we may not be as powerful we have 97 percent of our population just waiting to join the military <laughs> so it's it's probably hard being in the other species positions and seeing what kind of power we could have in store for them. But for now, I don't think we need to use it. And I don't think anybody in the Alliance thinks we need to use it. So I think we're all right. Uh, that's it for this one. Planets and locations. Gagarin Station is the largest deep space station built by humanity. A Bernal Sphere designed with a 500 meter diameter habitable area. Don't know what a Bernal Sphere is. Probably have to look that up. 
It was constructed beyond Pluto, nearly 80 astronomical units, or 12 billion kilometers from Sol, our sun. Moving crew and material to this location bankrupted most of the backers. No surprise, it's that far out, before we really had FTL travel too, so it's pretty damn far out. Gagarin was placed at the inner edge of the heliopause, the point at which the solar wind can no longer push back the interstellar medium. It was built to test a number of faster-than-light drive principles that theoretically could only occur in interstellar space, because we're pretty close to the... I'm, I imagine this is pretty close to the Oort cloud, so... or maybe it's on the edge of the Oort cloud, I don't know. But the point is, is that the vacuum of space is a lot less... Uh, what, what am I looking for? Uh... I don't know what I'm looking for there. It's a lot less affected by the solar wind out there is, what, I guess, what I'm looking for. The station was nicknamed Jump Zero, as it was intended to be the jumping-off point for humanity's expansion into the galaxy, once we figured out how the hell to travel billions of miles to Arcturus, that is. Shortly after the station was completed, the Prothean ruins were discovered on Mars, rendering the entire effort moot. Wow, that sucks. After struggling to make a profit for a decade, Gagarin was sold to the Systems Alliance in 2159 for a fraction of its construction costs. The Alliance refurbished it as a research and training center for the recently discovered biotic phenomenon. In 2169, the Biotic Acclimation and Training Program was shut down and Gagarin became a general research facility. Its remote location and intentional isolation from the extranet makes it popular for dangerous research, particularly in the field of artificial intelligence, but don't tell anybody in the council we said that. Humanity's first stable AI, the Alliance-sponsored ELIZA, achieved sapience at Gagarin on, in 2172. Today, Gagarin Station has a permanent population of approximately 9,000. A plan has been proposed to move it to the gravitationally stable Barry Center point between Pluto and the Charon Relay, allowing it to serve as a gateway facility between Sol and Arcturus systems. The high cost, and, uh, the high cost of safely moving its mass has delayed this indefinitely. Also, probably all of the research that's going on there which would make it being a gateway to the rest of the galaxy kind of difficult for all the people who are trying to conduct genetic engineering experiments and AI there. Again, don't tell the council we said that. <laughs> Technology. What have we got? We did biotic amps already. Training. Biotic implants and amplifiers only provide the potential to create coherent mass effect fields. Whether biotics can actually do so is largely determined by their training. Biotics must develop conscious control over their nervous systems, sending specific electrical impulses to the element zero nodules embedded in their nerves. They are taught to use their implants and amps with biofeedback devices and physical mnemonics. Specific gestures or muscle movements fire the proper sequence of nerves to activate a certain skill. That's why whenever you see Shepard use throw, she always pulls her hand back and then shoots it at them, like some sort of for, you know elaborate force push skill. Uh, because that seems to fire the nerves in her arm, because of all the muscles contracting and expanding there, uh, to shoot a sequence of nerves down her fingers, which causes her to project a mass effect field out of her hand that then hits the enemy and throws them for a loop. So that's how that works. Kind of, I'm assuming. Kinetics Industries pioneered biotic training with the Biotic Acclimation and Temperance Training Program. Although BOT did not achieve the desired results, many techniques taught are still used today. Many human think tanks are trying to develop some form of biotic super soldier. Most are benign efforts to create more flexible troops. Others, less publicly known, probably on Gagarin Station, are unapologetic attempts to create Nietzscheism supermen. Nietzschean supermen, excuse me. And that's, you know, Frederick Nietzsche, important. Was he a psychologist? I don't remember if he was an actual psychologist or if he was a sociologist or what. He is an important thinker in the determination of this whole survival of the fittest thing, and he came after, uh, oh god, on the origin of species, who the hell did that? Damn it, my biology class was way too long ago. I'm sorry, I'm an idiot, <laughs> but that guy, the one who sailed out trying to discover God created animals and then discovered that they weren't created by God. There was a specific adaptability that each creature had. That that guy. I know who I'm talking about. I just can't remember his last name at this point. Whatever. The, the point is that they're trying to create super soldiers. Sort of akin to the whole Marvel super soldiers Captain America thing, but they haven't had any success because biotics are a very uh, difficult matter to deal with. Oh, and to talk about kinetics a little bit, uh, Shepard's L1 implants when she was on Earth were implanted by Kinetics Industries slightly after she was, uh, she 
hit puberty uh, because she didn't have the money for the surgery. Uh, but they didn't recruit her for, for bot because they were primarily looking for people who were younger. And at that point, well, I guess it doesn't really make too much sense because I think Caden was born before Shepard, if I remember right. Um, but yeah, they didn't they didn't recruit her for bot, probably because of the people she was running with. But we'll talk about that later. Anyway, communications methodology. As the population of the galaxy increases and new worlds are settled, timely access for home users and frontier settlements with underdeveloped communication infrastructures is a growing problem. To ameliorate bandwidth issues, a sophisticated array of data caches and virtual intelligence search agent programs are available. When a user submits a query, it is first routed to the data cache on their colony or star system. At the cache, the user's search agent VI collates mountains of locally stored data to find the desired material. If the information is not available locally, the query is passed along to neighboring systems and then outward in an expanding network. VI search agents in those systems replicate the search. If the desired information is found, it is, comp it is compressed into a burst file and queued for transmission to the source system. The burst is assigned a priority based on the number of queries for it. The greater the number of queries, the higher the priority. When a new solar system is first connected to the net, a selection of the most popular data is installed locally. Though storage hardware is cheap, the capacity required to hold all the data produced every day by trillions of people on hundreds of worlds is not trivial. It's not economical to store local copies of all the data available on obscure topics just in case someone decides to search for it. If they want to search for it, they got to go to the Citadel, damn it. As colonies mature, older and less popular chunks of data filter into them as a result of queries and are placed in the local archive. Searches for obscure topics are increasingly likely to produce instant results as the archive grows. Which makes sense because, you know, people, there may be a trend or a fad or something like that going on on the planet that they wouldn't have a lot of information on, but uh, then people search for it and then they're like, oh, there's a high query for this, so we'll, we'll put priority on it and then we'll get it to you guys. So this explains how frontier worlds are able to be settled, basically, and instead of being completely dark from the extranet for a while. And, you know, they're dark for a little while because they have to get their communications set up. But once they're no longer dark from the whole extranet, they connect with these data caches. They have a little bit of information that they would need in order to keep their world expanding and growing. And then when they have questions, they make a query for it. And then when enough queries come in for that data, it gets sent back to them uh, via the VI in their data caches. So that's how they basically uh, do what they do out in space uh, when they first settle a frontier world. So we're not completely alone out there when you first settle a world, but it's still probably not what we're used to because I imagine Earth has a lot of topics uh, in its extranet files because so many people lived there before we started settling everywhere else. Ships and vehicles. Let's see. That's probably more on the Normandy, honestly. Um, Faster than we light drives, use this, element I think. zero cores yeah, we did to this reduce one. the mass. Let's look at this one. The no Sovereign is the flagship of the rogue Spectre's Saren. An enormous dreadnought larger than any other ship in any known fleet, it is crewed with both Geth and Krogan. At two kilometers long, its spinal-mounted main gun is likely capable of penetrating another dreadnought's kinetic barriers with a single shot. How Saren acquired this incredible warship is unknown. The prevailing opinion is that Sovereign is a Geth construct while others believe it is a Prothean relic. Its design, however, hints at a more alien and mysterious origin. The attack on Eden Prime demonstrated Sovereign's ability to generate mass effect fields powerful enough to land on a planetary surface. This implies it has a massive element zero core and the ability to generate staggering amounts of power. So yeah, if you didn't know, the uh, giant squid ship that we saw on Eden Prime was this flag, this flagship of Saren, Sovereign. It is populated by Geth and Krogan, which makes me wonder why we didn't see Krogan on uh, Eden Prime, probably because they're difficult to fight in the beginning of the game and they didn't want to make it too hard for you. But uh, what it is, we don't know. All we know is Saren's using it as a tool in order to get what he wants in the galaxy, and that is not good. <laughs> Apparently, also, this uh, ship has the capacity to indoctrinate people based on what Saren wants. I don't know if that's just a program from the ship, but it could have something to do with this more alien and mysterious origin that we're talking about. We won't know that until much later, but we'll we'll figure that out eventually, so don't worry about it. Now one that's on more generic topics such as space combat. Ship mobility dominates space combat. 
The primary objective is to align the mass accelerator along the bow with the opposing vessel's broadside. Battles typically play out as artillery duels, fought at ranges measured in thousands of kilometers, though assaults through defended mass relays often occur at knife fight ranges, as close as a few dozen kilometers. Most ship-to-ship -ship engagements are skirmishes between patrol vessels of cruiser weight and below, with dreadnoughts and carriers only deployed in full-scale fleet actions. Battles in open space are short and often inconclusive, as the weaker opponent typically disengages. Once a ship enters FTL flight, the combat is effectively over. There are no sensors capable of tracking them or weapons capable of damaging them. The only way to guarantee an enemy will stand and fight is to attack a location they have a vested interest in, such as a settled world or a strategically important mass relay. Of course, if they bring a ship like Sovereign to the fight, you need to jump to FTL right away anyway, because if it can penetrate a dreadnought with a single shot, that, that, that combat isn't going to last very long. But um, what was I going to say about this one? Oh, yeah, something that doesn't really make sense to me. They always said, oh, when they jump to FTL, the fight's over. But a lot of primary mass relays are one way. Like, they only go to one system. So if you're fighting in a system where there's a primary mass relay and that's the only way they can disengage you, why not just, you know, have a good amount of your forces uh, in the system that you're in and then station some forces, have them sh jump to FTL to the next system where the primary mass relay goes so that then when they jump to FTL, you can just pincer them and just, you know, destroy whatever's left of their units after they've already jumped to FTL because they wouldn't retreat unless they had significant enough losses to where you only need to put like a fourth of your army on the other side of that uh, mass relay. But I don't think they ever really explain how that works. I don't think we ever get into a combat situation in the series where we're fighting over two star systems like in two different places you know of course they could just jump to another star cluster at ftl speed but i don't think that's what they were talking about i think they were talking about the mass relays mostly so yeah my question still stands i don't know um did we do this one this is the blue shifting one right yeah, yeah it was red shift blue shift yeah so we did the appearance one. We'll do drive charge now. As positive or negative electric current is passed through an FTL drive core, it acquires a static electrical charge. Drives can be operated an average of 50 hours before they reach charge saturation. This change is proportional to the magnitude of mass reduction. A heavier or faster ship reaches saturation more quickly because they need to use more power in order to move. If the charge is allowed to build, the core will discharge into the hull of the ship. <laughs> That's not good. All ungrounded crew members are fried to a crisp, all electronic systems are burned out, and metal bulkheads may be melted and fused together. Honestly, I could see that as a... Like, if they were kamikaze anyway, and they had important technology on their ship that the other ship that they're fighting might want access to, maybe they would just intentionally do that to fry the technology, you never know. But still seems like a pretty bad thing to have on your ship. It's like, oh yeah, make sure everything works right, or you get fried to a crisp. <laughs> The safest way to discharge a core, anyway, is to land on a planet and establish a connection to the ground, like a lightning rod. Larger vessels like dreadnoughts cannot land and must discharge into a planetary magnetic field. That's why you see all of those um, drive core discharge notes in a lot of the gas giants. They discharge all of this, like dreadnoughts and stuff like that, they all go to these planets and they discharge their, ma their uh, fields into the gas giant's magnetic field, and then it, it takes advantage of that. There's probably more thunderstorms on the gas giant, but whatever, it's a gas giant. You know, they always have thunderstorms, so. The ship passes the charge from the drive core to the exterior armored hull, then dives into the magnetic field. As the hull discharges, sheets of lightning jump away into the field, creating beautiful auroral displays on the planet. The ship must retract its sensors and weapons while dumping charge to prevent damage, leaving it blind and helpless. Discharging at a moon with a weak magnetic field can take days. Discharging into the powerful field of a gas giant may require less than an hour. Deep space facilities such as the Citadel often have special discharge facilities for visiting ships because they would have to for the ships to be able to, you know, land safely without electrocuting everyone around them, you know. Combat endurance. Heat limits the length and intensity of ship-to-ship -ship combat. Starships generate enormous heat when they fire high-energy weapons, perform maneuvering burns, and run onboard combat electronics. 
In combat, warships produce heat more quickly than they can disperse it. As heat builds within a vessel, the crewed species, uh, spaces become increasingly uncomfortable. Before the heat reaches lethal levels, a ship must win or retreat by entering FTL. After an FTL run, the ship halts, shuts down non-essential systems, and activates the heat radiation gear. At which point you can blast them out of the sky if you did what I said and pincer attacked them. <laughs> Combat endurance varies by ship design and by the battle's location. Battles in the deep cold of interstellar space can go on for some time. Engagements close to a star are brief. Since habitable worlds excuse me, are usually close to a star, battles over them are frantic. Anything else? Yep, heat management and guardian. Dispersal of heat generated by onboard systems is a critical issue for a ship. If it cannot deal with heat, the crew may be cooked within the hull, as we've said many times. Radiation is the only way to shed heat in a vacuum. Civilian vessels util utilize large, fragile radiator panels that are impossible to armor. Warships use diffuse radiator, diffuse radiator arrays, DRAs, ceramic strips along the exterior of the armored hull. These make the ship appear striped and thermogra to thermographic sensors. Since the arrangement of the ship's de strips depends on the internal configuration of the ship, the patterns for each vessel are unique and striking. Oh, excuse me. On older ships, the DRAs, uh, the DRA strips, could become red or white hot. Dubbed tiger stripes or war paint by humans, the glowing DRA had a psychological impact on pirates and irregular forces. Because they're that hot, so basically if you you struck the ship in any way, they would basically cook whatever you're striking them with. So, Don't run into ships that have these uh, panels on them, basically. Strip radiators are not as efficient as panels, but if damaged by enemy fire, the ship only loses a small portion of its total radiation capacity. In most cases, a vessel's DRA alone allows it to cruise with no difficulties. Operations deep within the solar system can cause problems. A ship engaged in combat can produce titanic amounts of heat from maneuvering burns and weapons fire. When fighting in a high heat environment, warships employ high efficiency, quote, droplet heat sinks. In a droplet system, tanks of liquid sodium or lithium absorb heat within the ship. The liquid is vented from, a spray, from spray nozzles near the bow as a thin sheet of millions of micrometer scale droplets. The droplets are caught at the stern and recycled into the system. A droplet system can sink 10 to 100 times as much heat as DRA strips. Droplet sheets resemble the surface ship's wake through the water. The wake peels out in sharp turns, spreading a fan of droplets as the ship changes vectors and leaves the coolant behind. So that's how you keep the ship cool, basically. And uh, it gives you an idea of why we're getting light metals, such as lithium, to uh, be surveyed on these planets, because we need it in order to keep our ships cool. So that's a nice touch, I like that. Last but not least, Guardian. A ship's General Area Defense Integration Anti-Spacecraft Network, or Guardian, consists of anti-missile, anti-fighter laser turrets on the exterior hull. Because these are under computer control, the gunnery control officer needs to do little beyond turn the system on and designate targets as hostile. So basically that's what Chief Williams would do if we were in a firefight with the Normandy, she would do all of that. Although then she would do other things in order to help us out because there's probably more important responsibilities than turning it on and being like, hey, these guys are hostile and these guys are hostile and these guys are hostile. Fire! So, yeah. Since lasers move at light speed, they cannot be dodged by anything moving at non-relativistic speeds. Unless the beam is aimed poorly, it will always hit its target. In the early stages of a battle, the Guardian fire is 100% accurate. It's not 100% lethal, but it doesn't have to be. Damaged fighters must break off for repairs. Lasers are limited by diffraction. The beam spreads out, increasing the energy density watts per meter squared the weapon can place on a target. Any high-powered laser is a short-range weapon, because if it wasn't, it wouldn't have as much power, because you'd need to give it less power so that it wouldn't spread out as much. The less uh, amount of light that you're concentrating into it, the less it spreads out as it goes. Guardian networks have another limitation, heat as we just talked about. Weapons-grade lasers require cool-down time, during which heat is transferred to sinks or radiators. As lasers fire, heat builds within them, reducing damage, range, and accuracy. It's kind of like a how our guns work, really. Oh, excuse me. The guns have relatively infinite ammo, but as you shoot them more and more, they start to overheat, and then you need to drop the heat sink in order to uh, let them, uh, you know, cool down. Fighters the smaller ships we talked about before, attack in swarms. The first few will be hit by Guardian, but as battle continues, the effects of laser overheat allow the attackers to press ever closer to the ship. Constant use will burn out a laser. So I imagine that means the first fighters are usually unmanned, so that way they don't just lose people. That, that would be kind of dumb. Be like, hey, yeah, you're in the first wave of fighters today. Good luck dying out there. 
That would suck. Guardian lasers typically operate in infrared frequencies. Shorter frequencies would offer superior stopping power and range. Oh, excuse me. But degradation of focal arrays and mirrors would make them expensive to maintain, and most prefer mechanical reliability over bleeding edge performance where lives are concerned. Solarians, however, use near ultraviolet frequency lasers with six, six times the range, believing that having additional time to shoot down incoming missiles is more important, probably, than having most armor because they're Solarians and so they do most of their operations covertly, so having more weapons power is more efficient for them. Lasers are not blocked by the kinetic barriers of capital ships. However, the range of lasers limits their use to rare knife fight range ship to ship combat, which you don't usually see on the larger ships anyway, so worth noting. And I think that's it. We got through those in about half an hour, I think, if I'm reading the time correctly. But the point of the matter is that they're all done now. So we don't have to read them for an hour or an hour and a half like we did with the last ones. Oh, God. We'll get more when we go to the Citadel here in a little while, but they won't be nearly as bad as we had the last time we were on the Citadel. But while we're there, we'll also be stopping off to pick up some more armor for my non-human crew members and also probably looking around to see if there's anything else that needs doing in the Alliance Command while we're out uh, and about in the galaxy, waiting for the Cypher to take effect. On the next episode of Mass Effect, or, well, the next several sessions, really. But regardless of that, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you next time.